All right, board members, I have a quorum of board members in my line of sight. I am now going to call this budget work session to order. And um, we're going to have several meetings about the budget in the course of the next year. And it's kind of like being at, at King's Dominion or Bush Gardens and getting on that roller coaster and just pulling out of the station. We're going to have a quite a ride, I think, over the next year. So I want to introduce um, three of our distinguished folks here. We have, of course, uh, Susan Quinn, Kristen Michael, and Carol Hurley. And um, I'll just let you know that I, I've learned to remember Carol's last name because of uh, NCAA basketball. If you're a Duke lover or hater, you probably remember Bobby Hurley. <laughs> so. Carol, welcome, and uh, I'll turn it over. Am I turning it over to Kristen or Susan first, or Dr. Garza? Please, Dr. Garza. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Velkoff. Um, uh, we have a wonderful team at the end. You know that lots of work is underway um, intently, a lot of intent work uh, on the fiscal year 17 budget development. Um, some of that this morning, uh, some of the information that will be shared with you this morning is not new information, but updated information. Uh, so one of the first things will be about the fiscal forecast. That This same chart has been shared with you um, many, many times. I, don't, I haven't counted, but quite a number of times since early last spring, we started looking at fiscal forecast 17. But it's important as we walk through this to, again, talk about why so many things, so many variables are unknown and how we have to predict uh, those and just watch them over time as more and more of this information becomes uh, well known. And then after that, I know that the team will update you on the work of the task force. And so before we talk about the task force, maybe I'll save my comments about their work prior to that piece. Is that all right, Kristen? So, it's, okay, let's get started with the fiscal forecast. Good morning. Good morning. Fairfax County Public Schools completes a five-year forecast for each of our governmental funds that we include in our approved budget document. So the presentation this morning is going to be to review the school operating fund fiscal forecast for FY17. And as we go through that, I'm going to give you updates um, to what we presented to you in April, and those are also updates to what's included in the approved budget document. So just as a reminder, the fiscal forecast or our forecast for the upcoming year is updated throughout the process. So after today, the next time that we'll see an update in the forecast is in November. And at that point, we'll be giving an update both on student enrollment based on our September 30th official enrollment data and also in terms of the Virginia retirement system rates. Um, we're hoping that we'll have an actuarial evaluation in October. So just remember, this is just one of the many steps as we adjust this fiscal forecast throughout the process. So as we look through the fiscal forecast presentation, matching the slides that are posted, we also have a summary chart. And I wanted to note that we've highlighted the items on the chart that are highly variable, right? So items where we have a low ability to predict that we know will be updated throughout the process. So I'll also be highlighting those as we go through. Can I have the presentation? Do you, do you want that? So just as an, a note to remind us, FCPS continues to face fiscal challenges. The funding from the county has actually increased annually for the last number of years. But the important thing to remember is that increase in funding hasn't met our four major cost drivers in the budget. It hasn't met the needs of our employee salaries, enrollment growth, our retirement system contribution rates, and our health insurance rates. So it's really important when we talk about county funding, it has increased but it has not increased enough to cover just those four major cost drivers. So the funding from the county each year is set by the Board of Supervisors annually. So they determine how much funding is given to FCPS. And as you all know, it's not based on any type of a formula or increases in those costs. It's based on what the Board of Supervisors determines based on the revenue that they have available. So when we look at that county funding for pupil, again, it has increased, but if we adjust it for inflation, the county funding that we're receiving per pupil currently is less than we were receiving in 2008, right? 
So when we don't receive enough revenue to cover those required cost increases and our employee salary increases, the way we've needed to balance our budget is through reductions. So just a reminder, since 2008, we've taken nearly half a billion dollars in reductions. And if we hadn't made those reductions, today we ha would have well more than 2,000 employees serving our students. So the needs of our students have increased, our enrollment has increased, but at the same time we've continued to face those fiscal challenges, right? And balancing our budget on reductions is not sustainable. So first I'm gonna talk about the revenue. Our beginning balance for FY17 is fully funded at $27.8 million. That's funding that we've already set aside. While that is good news and that we've met that beginning balance requirement, the bad news of that is it still leaves us with a structural imbalance. So we're still using one-time funding to help us balance the budget. But I'm gonna remind you of that again at the end. So it's an important thing to remember. The next for this slide at the top of the chart, we're showing the county transfers level. And we do that so when we get to the end, we can show what level of transfer we would need in order to balance the budget. The next item is state aid. State aid is highlighted because it's extremely variable. This number is also a number where we've updated this based on our pro previous forecast to you in April. So we're currently projecting that our state aid will decrease by $9 million for FY17 as compared to our 16 budget. So I wanted to take just a minute to talk about the state budget. So a year ago, Governor McAuliffe announced that we had a huge shortfall facing the state right, as many of you may remember. At that point in time, they had instituted layoffs. They took a number of different um, adjustments to try to get their budget in balance. That was just a year ago, right? Then last April, when they approved funding for us for this current school year, they were still so unsure of their projections that they made revenue to us for teacher compensation contingent upon them meeting their revenue projections for the year. That's something that hasn't happened the entire time I've been here which says they were really unsure about their revenue forecast. Then where did the state end up? They ended up with a surplus of $536 million when they got to the end of their fiscal year. So what we're hearing now from G Governor McAuliffe is that education is his highest priority, right? But we still don't know what that will mean in terms of an impact to FCPS. Will that funding go to all jurisdictions? Will it be allocated based on the LCI, which could very negatively impact FCPS? Will that funding come with strings attached or for, for specific programs that may or may not? So we're still projecting that we have that decrease in state aid of nine million, but obviously that's one of the items that's highly variable that we'll be updating. So when we look at that funding, it's important to remember in our FY16 state budget, we had one-time funding for our compensation incentive of 4.7 million. So they'll have to make up that one-time funding that they funded. So we still have that reduction and we're waiting for our local composite index to reset. We know that preliminary data that we've seen in terms of taxable sales overall statewide is positive as well as um, real estate property values, but we won't know the actual impact of the LCI until that information comes out later in the fall. The next item in our projection is sales tax. That's also highlighted as highly variable. We are projecting a 3% increase. That's an increase of $5.5 million. Our sales tax also has been very volatile. So just for example, our most recent sales tax receipts were actually a slight decrease from our actual receipts a year ago. That was our September collections. So we do think this 3% at this point is a, a solid estimate, but that's something we'll need to continue to watch. Our next item is federal aid. We're projecting that that remains flat. This is primarily for individuals with Disabilities Education Act or special education, as well as impact aid for our federal properties. And then the next line item is Fairfax City and others. We are projecting a 2% increase across this category. It includes the tuition that we charge to Fairfax City. That's the majority of that funding, as well as tuition that we charge for students who attend CJ and other programs, as well as miscellaneous revenue. So that shows us when we combine all of those items that we have funds available of negative 2.2 million. So on this chart, this is a little bit complicated, but we also showed the decrease in funding for the one-time radio replacement. Now this is offset by a related expenditure reduction, so there's no net impact at all, right? And the same with be that beginning balance funding. That's just a change from our 16 approved budget when we had set aside the four million. So you'll see both of those offset later in this presentation. Um, but in total, that gets us to an, a negative of 4.4 million. 
So that data is included in the column to the far right. The column on the far right shows our current forecast as a change from our approved budget. And the column second from the right shows our forecasted change, what it was in April as compared to our approved budget. So the approved budget is a column on the far left. Then we showed for you guys today both the projections we made um, in April. That's the second column. And then the third column is our forecast today. Okay, so that's revenue. So moving forward to expenditures, the first um, expenditure item that we have, which is also highlighted as highly variable, is our enrollment and student demographic changes. Um, that projection is consistent with what we've shared with you in April, and it's also a level projection with FY16. So at this point in the fiscal forecast, the way we project enrollment and demographics is we use our historical information from the prior year. So that's the increased cost for our current budget. Now we will be getting all new enrollment projections based on our September 30th actual enrollment. When we get those, we'll calculate the enrollment by school, by grade, by program, and those are the projections that will be included in the proposed budget. So then we'll be updating it there. The next section is compensation. The first item that we have in compensation is base savings. Those are our savings due to turnover. It's a savings of 19.1 million that we have projected for the next year. And turnover represents the savings from when employees leave the school system and we hire a newer employee who's less experienced than the employee who left. When we look at our, our base savings, remember in the past, we always used base savings to help us fund the step increase for employees. Right? Only when we went into the economic downturn did we start relying on this funding to help us balance our budget instead of helping us use it to address employee salary increases. Also, when we look at our actual um, expenditures from FY15 that just ended, our variance in terms of our compensation accounts was 1.2%, primarily coming from benefits, and there were some from salaries as well. So we know our projections in these accounts have become much tighter. So this is another area where we'll be watching our expenditures as we head into the school year and adjusting anything we need to make in terms of compensation adjustments. Um, the next item are salary increases for our employees. We have a step increase in our market scale adjustment of 1.5%. These are both dollar placeholder amounts, and they're based on the same methodology or same amount that was used by the county in their multi-year budget. So they had the equivalent of a step increase and a 1.5% market scale adjustment. Now we're undergoing our compensation study, so how the actual compensation increases will be implemented may very well change, but this is a placeholder for both of those amounts. And you can see that a step increase is 41.6 million and a 1.5% market scale adjustment is 31 million. The next line item on our chart is a health insurance increase. You'll be getting a presentation later this afternoon on health insurance. Um, we're projecting a $15.6 million increase in terms of our health insurance rates for next year. And then the next line item that we have highlighted, also variable that I mentioned earlier, is the increase in the rate for the Virginia retirement system. <coughs> so for this biennium, fiscal year 17, which is next school year, school year 16, 17, we have that next 10% increase in the actuarial rate. So we'll be moving from 90 or 80% of the actuarial rate to 90%, right? It's the last uh, adjustment before getting to 100% in FY19. So that increase in the actuarial rate is projected to be 24.3 million. You'll see that that's a change from the rate that we had projected in April, right? That's a decrease of a half a percent that recognizes the half a percent impact that the state's one-time funding to VRS that they made in the spring had on our current year rate and we carried that projection forward. Um, and again, we'll be updating our VRS estimate after we get the actuarial valuation, which we hope to have in late October. So in the last item on the slide is FCERS, that's the county's retirement system. Um, we are projecting an increase in that um, from 21.99 to 22.31%, and that increase is valued at 0.6 million. In terms of ERFC, that rate is projected to be level for FY17, so no change there. That's why it's not on the slide. So on the next slide, when we move into logistics and other expenditures, the first item is utilities. We're projecting a million dollar increase in terms of utilities due to our expiration of utility <coughs> contracts and new rates. So it's important to remember that we had all of the cost savings from synergistics, right? That, that's really a cost avoidance. It helped us reduce what we're spending in terms of utilities, but we still have the impact of increasing rates. So while our overall usage went down, our rates are going up. So that's this change. 
Um, we have contractual increases included in the budget at $4.7 million. Those include, for example, our maintenance contracts, technology contracts, postage, library databases, and vehicle services. So that's $4.7 million. Um, we have updated that as compared to what we had in April based on the current information, and we'll continue to monitor that as we move through the process. And then we've also included funding of $2.2 million for bus replacement. We're really working to get back to where we have a sustainable level of funding and where we're, where we're regularly replacing our buses. So that's $2.2 million. The next two items that are highlighted are our strategic plan investments and unfunded needs. It's really important to remember as we move through this forecast and are showing this deficit that there's absolutely no funding set aside for either of these. So when we look at funding and the things in our strategic plan, both in terms of student success, caring culture, premier workforce, or resource stewardship, we currently have no funding included in this deficit for any of those items, although we know we need to make expenditures there. And it also doesn't address any of our unfunded needs. So it doesn't include increasing the number of students we serve in preschool or helping us to reduce that waiting list for pre-K, addressing class size, funding preventative maintenance, or any of those items. So the next section that you'll see is this is the one-time investments. So as I pointed out in the revenue section, we saw that revenue decrease of 8.2. Here's the corresponding expenditure decrease. And that was for our staffing reserve um, funding, the one-time funding, and mostly for the transportation radio replacement reserve. Then the last section on this page are our transfers out. We do have an increase for FESEP, which is our preschool education program. Based on our increasing salary and benefit projected costs, we'll need to increase the transfer for our matching portion of that grant funded program. And then we'll also have a slight adjustment in terms of adult um, ESOL education. And then lastly, our construction funding will decrease based on the projects currently in the CIP. So in summary on slide six, our total funds available are showing that decrease of 14.4 million and our expenditures are projected to increase by 115 million. When you combine those together and then you assume that we'll get a 3% increase in the county transfer, that's the 54.8 million, it leaves us with a projected deficit after the increase in funding from the county of 71.6 million, right? If the county were to fund the entire deficit both that 3% transfer and to help us address this 71.6, um, we would actually need a county increase that would more than double this 3%. So at the very beginning, I wanted to remind you that we had that structural imbalance from beginning balance, that one-time funding that we used of 27.8. If we were to add that to this projected deficit of 71.6, if we didn't have that one-time funding available, our gap would exceed $100 million. So the next page talks about why does our projected deficit change, right? Each year we update the forecast throughout the budget process and you'll see even today and as we move forward into November that we'll continue to update these estimates, right? It's important to remember that funding from the state won't be known until the spring, right? In the spring we'll also receive updated enrollment projections for next school year that will also recalculate our enrollment and then we'll know how much funding we're going to receive both from the county and the state in the spring. So the last slide, slide eight, shows the budget timeline. So just to remind everyone, this is the same timeline that we've used each year, and we're planning for the 2016-2017 school year. So from last spring, actually, through November, we'll be updating the fiscal forecast and engaging the community in our budget discussions. Then the governor's going to propose his budget in late December, right? About the same time schools are completing their course catalogs for next school year. Both of those actions occur just before the superintendent releases her proposed budget in the first week in January. Then the school board will adopt your advertised budget in early February. At the same time, probably about a week later, the county executive is going to present his advertised budget to the county board of supervisors. The state will finalize their budget in March, right about the same time that students are actually selecting their courses for the 16-17 school year. Then the county will advertise the tax rate. That's the highest possible rate that they can use for taxes in early March. And then the Board of Supervisors will vote on that final tax rate as well as a transfer to FCPS in April, which means the school board will determine the final adjustments necessary based on the revenue we receive from both the county and the state when you adopt your budget in late May. <coughs> so any questions on the forecast? 
So what, what's the order? Ilion, Jamie. So the order is Ilion, Mr. Moon, then Ms. Strauss, and Ms. McLaughlin. Mr. Moon. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question or two regarding uh, state aid. I understand that the numbers we see are the best estimates at this point in time, and state is going to be doing a biennium their you know, budgeting uh, uh, in the upcoming General Assembly session. But as far as their current surplus they are sitting on at this point, do you know whether they do, just like a Board of Supervisors and like we do, whether they have a legal obligations to take some actions on their surplus? And if they do, when will that be? And what if they allocate some funding out of their 500 plus million dollars of a surplus, do we consider that to be a one-time funding? And whether that is shown anywhere, or whether it is way too early for us to predict or guesstimate, estimate, anything about that? So the county's budget surplus, that $500 million, the majority of that funding In went the state. State, sorry. The state's $536 million surplus, the majority of that, I'm only wishing it were the county, that, that funding at the state level went almost all of it into their rainy day fund and no additional funding from that surplus is going to K-12 education, right? So I don't see that surplus impacting our state budget for next year. Now hopefully some of the underlying things that cause the surplus, like increased income and other things will help increase the state's tax base that will help when they go through the process of rebenchmarking and doing their state updates for the next year. But, but we won't see any impact from the so funding since from all last year. the 500 million dollars went into rainy day fund, we should not be expecting anything out of that surplus. Correct. That's a done deal. That's too bad. That, that's correct. And as Kristen mentioned, the underlying increase in that Revenue item, I, understand I do that think, about is somewhat FI recurring. So it I was will sort of hoping they would still yeah. get some money from the surplus they had. Our indication is we will not be receiving any additional funding from the state, other than the revenue was confirmed that was um, based on the revenue projections for us to get the compensation incentive. They said if the revenue projections met the um, increase, they would provide that revenue. So we, we know we're going to receive that particular revenue item for the compensation incentive. But other than that, no indication that we would be getting any additional funding for 16. OK, thank you. Mrs. Strauss. OK, I have two questions regarding um, state issues. And then the very last slide that looks at the budget timeline and uh, course catalogs. Um, LCI adjustment response, what is, the, what is the date that we will know about how, all of that, or will that be folded into the, the governor's release of this proposed budget? So when the governor releases his budget, we will see the combined impact of that LCI adjustment with rebenchmarking, which occurs at the beginning of each biennium, so those will be combined. We are hopeful that we'll get news on what the possible LCI change in terms of the LCI number will be sooner than that, right? But we won't know the actual dollar impact until it's combined with benchmarking when the governor releases his budget in late, sep or late December. Oh, right, December. I, I think the other things that are important to note when we think back, right, the last two um, bienniums, when we look back, when we look at the biennium for 12, 14, and then 2010 to 2012, those two LCI adjustments together gave FCPS an increase of state funding of $100 million. Right. right now, prior to that, we had seen in the 2008-2010 biennium that that LCI adjustment reduced FCPS's funding by $25 million. So you can see that based on that adjustment, those amounts have really varied wildly. Widely. And the, the rebenchmarking will be based on two-year-old data, correct? That is correct. So it will be on basically wealth uh, values of 2013, is that 2012, 2013 for Fairfax County or 2013, 2014? Which year are we looking at for data from Fairfax County? 
It depends on what the item is. Some are 13 and some are 14. The state's total or benchmarking, I didn't bring that report with me. They have listed what that amount will be. Right, but it's important to note just because the items are included in the initial rib benchmarking estimation doesn't mean they'll be fully funded when the governor or the general assembly adopts their budget. Do we do we know those values now? And can we get those? They don't have all the items completed yet, but the initial report states that the rebenchmarking benchmarking for 17 is 170 no, I take that back. It's um, 178.7 million for 17 and 209 million for FY18. Okay. Could we get could we get some updated numbers? Not today, but so I'd like to know where that. What is. I could do is share with you the presentation that state had released because okay. there's still not complete because they still have to add in the VRS portion to all this right. rebenchmarking. So there's still items that are missing. But the rebenchmarking total of 387, I think, is slightly higher than where we were two years ago. So okay. two years ago, the combination okay. of the two biennium rebenchmarking was 350 million. Currently, it's 388 million without the couple of the components into the rebenchmarking. So that's an increase in funding that, that if they approve all the rebenchmarking um, okay. all right. formulas into the governor's budget. So what happens is they go through this rebenchmarking and then governor builds in within his budget whether or not he would fund all of this rebenchmarking cost. Mm -hmm. And then you apply the new LCI formulas to that number. Okay. But the governor could also include some additional investment into K-12 education. Right. So I think the key really is, as Kristen mentioned, we'll know our LCI number probably in the next month or two. Okay. Right. But so until we know the size of the pie right. for the K-12 education we in December, we won't really okay. know the impact right. of the governor's budget to right. FCPS. And the, the newly released um, JLARC study that looked at total um, uh, state investment in in education, um, there was interesting data there. There was some data that I wish that they would have provided. But do we anticipate that that will have any impact at all on the governor's budget? We just don't know. <laughs> if we only knew. If we only knew. OK. Um, my other question uh, pertains to the very last slide, which shows the budget planning and development sort of month by month. and. Um, trying to help people understand how our own, the, the decisions, particularly course, course offerings, those decisions have to be made so early on. Not only does that impact what students will sign up for, it will impact on teachers who decide to stay or leave. And actually, we've seen this problem before about 20 years ago. Um, so I, I assume we're working on contingency plans, January, particularly sort of the March, April, timeline piece when we have a better idea of, of our actual, what we actually are going to have to do. And the question is whether or not that's in time for us to save teachers' decisions as to whether or not they're going to stay. But I guess there's nothing we can do. That's the, that's the root of our challenge, that's particularly, it. particularly where we are today. Right. Um, because we have to act um, accordingly, right? right. The 3% uh, yeah. transfer. Right. Increase and so when we get to January, February, March, you know we're going to need to be in a position to execute a plan, right? Because what we have found in the past, we struggle when we get to May, and right. we know what we have now. And, and the teachers are gone, and ninety percent of our budget is personnel-related cost. Right. So in order, you know, sadly, what we've had to do is look at our compensation plan and back up on that right. to respond to the deficit, which has been painful. Exactly. Um, for the system. So we can't do that this year. We have to be prepared potentially to make right, very significant cuts yeah. early on. Yeah. And teachers have to make plans for their own families and their children right. and where they're going to live. And if it doesn't look very good, they will go. And that's our problem. And then we won't be able, we won't have the people to hire if in the end we end up having some of the money to run the courses we need. And, and assuming, let's assume for a moment we get a you know, significant amount of money from the state in December and you know I don't know about your crystal ball but you know let's say it's 20 million I think we would consider that a, a windfall our deficit still 
a little over 50 million, and it's really hard to get to that number. Right, without cutting so, courses. Yes, That's where we are. and so right. likely at some, you know, we'll make some very difficult decisions around cuts moving forward and what we'll do, but likely it will affect some, some um, employees. I know. Or the potential opportunity to hire some additional employees. And so some of those notices will have to begin in the spring. I know. And that's too bad. Thank you. So we have Ms. McLaughlin to be followed by Ms. Hines. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I guess the first uh, sort of just data question I have is looking at um, the fiscal forecast projection chart. Uh, I noticed under FY 2016 approved expenditures column um, we don't have numbers for um, a lot of that like base savings step increase msa um, health insurance rate increase i mean some of those it, it would have been helpful to just kind of know where we are in in this budget year like how much of an increase did we have in the health insurance rate so that it gives some context to what that looks like um, you know, now going into another budget year. So I don't know if it's possible to get those numbers, but where possible, I, I, I would find that helpful. Sure, we can provide you with those numbers so you can use them as a comparison, mm -hmm. right, just to see what the changes are. Great. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, on, on the one hand, it's great news to see that with the VRS adjustment and state funding forecast and, um, you know, we're looking at 13 million that we didn't realize it might now be there. Um, and, but then there was the additional increase in cost for health um, insurance. So the bottom line that we're now looking at is um, slightly improved numbers um, by about eight and a half million dollars. And I'm just wondering, um, thinking about our public discussion and certainly our relationship um, with our funding authority, um, what's the likelihood that, you know, things will continue to change? I think Dr. Garza stated it well, that we don't know what's gonna happen with the state. Um, but in my conversations with individual supervisors, I think that's one of the concerns they've had about this, you know, public dialogue to date, is that so much of this is fluid right now and uh, I think, you know, Dr. Garza, your task force has been a um, very important step in terms of just helping people understand the budget, what the forecast looks like. But I think we all have to be really um, mindful as we're talking to the public and saying, when you work with budgets this big, there is going to be a fluidity that um, is hard for people to wrap their brains around. I mean, tens of millions of dollars shifting here and there seems like so much to the general public. And um, we know in a budget like this that that can happen. So um, I guess I'm, I'm happy to see some, you know, slightly good news here, but I also think it then is important for us as board members and working with Dr. Garza that going forward, these numbers could continue to change. And I don't wanna find ourselves in a situation where the supervisors say, you've got a bouncing ball that just keeps changing and you know the public is getting worried your employees are getting worried and you know, where's this going so um, I think the, the final question I wanted to ask is when we look about changing numbers we know as a, a system with 90 percent compensation and you know um, raises are our major cost driver and looking at the county and again talking to the supervisors where they said look their goal right now is that they want a 4% increase for their employees. And we want to provide that same fair and equitable raise for our employees. Uh, but right now, what Ed then is projecting and presenting is they've got an 80 to $100 million projected deficit on their side. So in this early stage, we kind of look the same. But the county isn't having this conversation of, in order for us to do this, we need you now to start talking about we're gonna cut parks, cut library, cut human services. And I think that's where we're finding ourselves in a challenge. I know that they're our funding source and so they maybe don't feel the same pressures, but I think that's something we have to be really asking our supervisors is 
So if you're having your projected deficit based on your employee compensation forecast and desire, then are you prepared to see a budget that right now is going to come the same? And we're not going to necessarily um, be saying uh, we've got to decimate the school system, but what we are sort of saying is if you're not worried that you're going to decimate the county over this, then I guess are we supposed to all be on the same page that we're walking into this thing, both sides looking at $100 million each? Like I almost feel like we're just having these conversations in stovepipes or in isolation, and I, I would just say to my colleagues, I think that's something to be thinking about because that's kind of my individual conversations with supervisors is, well, we're, we're not chicken little saying the sky's falling, and right now we're, we're kind of having a similar budget deficit that you guys are. And I have had to push back and say, yeah, but you get the purse strings and we don't. So uh, for our budget chair and vice chair, I think that's something to really, um, hopefully we can continue to hone in on with them. Um, wow, lots to talk about there. Um, first of all, about chicken little. Um, being the superintendent of this system, I will tell you that the last thing I would like to do is be visiting with the community every year about what we're going to cut next. Last thing I want to be doing. But, um, you know, that's the environment we've been, the, the situation, the cards that we've been dealt is that we have to, again, uh, approach a budget that I have to present on January the 7th that's reflective of what we know, uh, we will have some kind of significant deficit. What that number is, I think, is, is still yet to be determined, but we all know, having cut almost a half a billion dollars out of operations, you know, can every year cutting, I mean, just the two years I've been here, um, 98 million, a little over 98 million the first year, last year almost six, 65 million, I mean, these are hard cuts to have to make. And I think the last one thing we want to do is roll out a budget on January 7th that's reflective of these kinds of cuts, and it's a surprise to our community. I think that's what we're trying to prevent is, you know, a shock to our community. Um, so, I mean, the fluidity, we've always had this fluidity, always. And so individuals, particularly those maybe that understand our budget process, I'm really shocked to hear that they don't understand that or call into question that we're moving or changing the numbers when they know full well that that's just that's the way this works. Um, in fact, um, when we finalize the budget in May, it's still going to be based upon a projection. It's still based upon unknowns because we haven't started school yet and we haven't opened the doors and, you know, that continues to change. So, um, you know, that's why we've put out the budget calendar to hopefully help the public out there understand that this is a uh, moving target and we do the very best we can with planning according to these timelines um, as still all those pink things still can, can, still can move. So um, do we want a long-term solution? We've been out there, we've been the ones beating that drum for a long time because at some point it's exhausting and demoralizing to this system, in my view, that we have to have this conversation every year. Folks, I, you know, fiscal year 17, gonna be terrible. We've been saying it for years, at least since I've been here, we've been talking about, about this. I'm even more worried about what's ahead. Fiscal year 18, 19, y'all, we, we we, what are we gonna do, really? as a system. So we continue to have to cut because our annual revenue available to us doesn't meet even just the basic needs that we have as a system. So in my view, we need a long-term solution and we need our county leaders to step up and help us develop that long-term solution. And if I could just thank, add, I think, you. go ahead. I'm sorry. I think one of the other key difference, and I think Dr. Garza alluded to this, was we have to plan for next school year, right? So we have to be out in the front about where we're headed with this budget and what reductions we may need, might need to make as we balance the budget. Because we don't have control over that revenue side. Whereas I think while county is still facing a deficit, they can control that revenue side. They don't have to do reductions if the Board of Supervisors choose to increase the revenue side of their um, budget. But I think where we stand is we can't control the revenue. All we have is guidance from the county 
and the best estimate from the state. And because we have to plan for next school year, we have to get ahead of all of this. And that's why we're starting a lot earlier than the county would typically do. And, and, and we're following the same timeline we always have. But I do think, to your point, Susan, the other thing I, I think that, and I had a conversation with Ed Long about this recently, is it's very difficult for them to compare our, what we do in our enterprise to all their other county agencies. Because they can determine, you know, this is the amount of money we have, so we're not going to offer any additional services or we're going to cut back on services. When It's very different when we start school and we accept and enroll every student that walks through our door. So it's a, you know, the growth is a mitigating factor that they don't necessarily have to respond to in the same way we do. That's why it's a very different kind of dynamic that we are, we're challenged with. I'm going to interject a comment, if I may, Ms. Hines. Um, you know, if, if there are folks in the community who um, are distrustful of the changing estimates, uh, in some ways it means that we're victims of our own transparency. I mean, I, I can't imagine how we could not be bringing more information forward than, than the way that these folks um, have been doing. We know the supervisors have a, a very different process. And uh, there's not even unanimity among them about that process because some of them, I think, would rather have some of the kinds of conversations that we're beginning now and actually begin in the summer. So, um, you know, they do have a different process. Um, and I'm very happy with what we're doing. So anyway, uh, Ms. Hines. Thank you. Um, just a few questions. On uh, slide four, uh, where we talk about uh, projected compensation changes. You mentioned the compensation study. And we did get a timeline by email, I think, from the superintendent of the, um, the study. And, you know, it looks like it's going to go out several months. So I'm wondering, um, is the timeline for the study going to work with our timeline for the budget? Are we going to get good information from the compensation study for our budget? So how's, just a little bit about how that's going to work. Yes. I. I do think while we might not have the information in order to include it in the proposed budget, right, that we'll certainly have it well in time for us to adopt the approved budget in May, right, and the board will continue to get updates on that process um, as we work through that compensation study. Okay, so the compensation study may change some of our thinking as we go along. Yeah, okay, good. I, um, on, on the compensation study on that, um, that's a huge study, and we did ask for some of the information to, you know, we've we tried to phase it so we'd have some of the more critical information earlier than later because it, these compensation studies, some of you may have been around when we've done these before, they take almost a calendar year uh, to complete. Uh, that's why we don't do them that frequently. Um, so I think any additional infusion of dollars into our scales helps with that, but we know we're going to have to look at some long-term policy decisions as a result of the compensation study. They may recommend a completely different structure for salary and compensation. I think it's likely that they'll recommend a big infusion of, of dollars uh, into particular scales, like our teacher scale, for example. And then we'll have to look at what's our long-term plan for phasing some of that in. So we might have some, some early work that we can maybe make flex a little bit, but I do think the findings of the compensation study will probably be more of a long-term, what do we need to change, where are we going, what's our direction? Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Slide five, um, just curious about the $1 million utility increase. Um, are we sort of thinking that synergistics will not be able to help us with that? We're not going to get more efficient as we go? Yes, we believe that we've included all of the projection or projected savings from synergistics in our base budget. This is really a contractual rate increase, right? So as we renegotiate our utility contracts, we think the rates will increase. Now, if we hadn't done synergistics, this rate increase would be significantly more. Okay, so it's sort of good news, right? <laughs> Um, it's definite right. good news. It's de okay. I mean, I'm, yeah, okay. Slide five. Um, the unfunded needs, um, if you wouldn't mind just listing again what we put in there. I heard you say class size and pre-K. What are some other things that you all are in, uh, talking about as unfunded needs? So we have class size, we have pre-K, we had preventative maintenance, student technology, 
We have no funding for innovation in our strategic plan. We're way behind in terms of replacement equipment. So our computers, for example, we have many, many um, that are very, very old. So funding for replacement equipment. I, th I think I got all of them. And then buses, but we included that on a separate funding line. Okay, thank you. I think it's just good to keep saying those things out loud because, you know. Um, lastly, slide six. Um, the, okay, the, the date of the advertised tax rate for the county, again, is early March, right? That's not really on this slide, but March 2nd, is that when they? I don't have the exact date because the county hasn't posted their final budget calendar for the upcoming year. Last year, it was approximately March 6th. Last year, the county did, did adjust their dates slightly because they wanted more time between when um, County Executive Ed Long introduced his advertised budget and when they set that tax rate. So once we have that final date, we will update you. But last year it was that first week in March. Right. And that's the point at which the county says, here's the maximum by which we would increase the um, real estate tax rate. Correct. Right. So a couple questions about that. Um, you mentioned that if we got, if we filled the $71.6 million hole that we're looking at there with just county increase, it would be between 6 and 7% uh, increase in the transfer. About how much in dollars is that? Oh, I'm so, of course. I'm looking right at it. So, <laughs> what, sorry. Um, what, got you. Okay, thank you. I'm thinking. Um, and then what is, what kind of tax increase is that? I mean, do we have a sense of how many pennies? It depends on values, of course. It's going to depend on the property values. If just for easy math, if we assume each penny on the tax rate is worth $20 million, right? If okay. we're looking to close a gap of $125 million, approximately, that would be five cents. Okay, so thank you. So again, the six to seven percent, whatever six the total. Six cents. <laughs> right, but the six cents, okay. All right, and then, so the, so I'm sorry, the total increase in transfer to cover that would be the 71.6 plus the three percent that they've already, okay, all right, thank you, sorry. Okay, we start a little late. We have about 10 minutes to go, and Ms. Evans, you're next. Oh, thank you very much. I um, wanted to go back to slide four, if we could, and uh, just wanted to, talk a little bit about the VRS rate increase. Um, you know, some of us here remember 2010 when we got that waiver from the state, which turned out to be sort of a Trojan horse. Um, they let us not pay and then said, you know, but in the future, you're going to be paying more and more. And here we are now paying more and more. Uh, could you go through uh, why it went from 30.8 to 24.3, why the reduction of six million? Yes, so last spring, when the General Assembly adopted their budget, they put additional funding into VRS. They made an additional allocation of approximately $150 million into that system. At that time, our rate was previously set for the school year at 14.5%, and that resulted in FCPS's rate decreasing for this current school year down to 14.06. Okay. So we carried forward that basically a half of a percentage point rate decrease mm -hmm. and adjusted our projection for next fiscal year by that same half a percent, which is about that six and a half million dollars. Okay. And this is an area where we're going to continue to see increases, isn't that correct? We will, we will have another significant increase in FY19 when we move to 100% of that actuarial valuation. Right, but that rate is calculated right each year based on things like their investment returns, how they're doing. Right. You know, they update items like mortality mm -hmm. um, and, and other pieces as they move through this process. But we won't be seeing huge significant rate increases, I wouldn't assume, once we get to 100% of that actuarial funding. And this brings us to what? Is this? 90. This is 90%. Correct. So we're at 90% and the next. This We're at the next, 80 currently. In at FY17, 80. we would move to 90%. And then the next big jump would be 19. 19. Okay. Is there any conversation <laughs> at the state level about making, doing this over a longer period of time, or has that been done? I haven't heard any conversations about doing this over a longer point in time. Mm -hmm. I, I think part of the challenge is, right, the longer you defer or the more you defer it, the more catching up you have to do, mm -hmm. right? So they've headed on a path to try to make sure that they're adequately funding this plan, right? Mm -hmm. And since they put that into their requirement, I, I think changing it would be significant. 
But so, we'll see. They could, the, the General Assembly could do anything. Right. But I haven't heard them discussing deferring this. So one last question. You know, you, you mentioned you know the return on investment as the economy starts to turn around. We hope and continue to turn around more. Is it possible that some of this would moderate naturally because the investments are improving? Or no? Is that? I, I think it, it does all depend on investment earnings within VRS, right? Because investment right. earnings is a great portion of how the VRS is funded. Right. You have the employer contribution, employee contribution, and investment earnings. But you also have to remember that's the revenue side. The other side is the experience within that plan. People are living longer. Right. <laughs> so there's a cost associated with that when you're on the benefit side. So even if you see increases in the investment income and they, as they smooth um, out the returns, depending on what's happening on the expense side, you may not see significant fluctuations in your actuarial rate. But it, it just all depends on the assumptions they use and the experience that they're having from those assumptions. Okay. And I think VRS is due to have their five-year experience study done this fall okay. to say what assumptions did they use and what did they actually realize in those five years. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Ms. Schultz. Um, what are the raw numbers driving that enrollment change? What, how many students is that expected? 2,300 students. 2,300 more students. And so what is that per student? Uh, just slightly less than $10,000 per student. Right, but again, this is just solely the same dollar amount that we included in our 16 budget as a placeholder for 17. We didn't in any way calculate this because we're waiting for those updated enrollment projections based on September 30th, and then we'll go back through and calculate enrollment at every single individual school and for each program. And what has been our accuracy rate over time on the number at this point to what is actually occurring? I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I know when we look at our projections, our spring projections as compared to the fall, right, we've done very well over a long well, period of time. Well, it's pretty easy to estimate in, in April or May who's coming back in September, but I'm talking about at this point. And that's, you know, it's a continuing point. I'm on the fourth year of asking this, and it hasn't, I still don't have an answer. Um, so I'm looking at 2,300 students driving that figure, and I don't know the correlation between that and an accuracy rate over time. So, and that also doesn't tell us wh who the students are, where they are, which is significant, because that, that's a different cost driver. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm a little bit surprised because by my colleagues, I've heard, what is the governor doing with his surplus? What's happening with the LCI adjustment? Um, what's happening with the JLARC study? What's happening with rebenchmarking? Let's assume we're going to get more money from the state. What's the Board of Supervisors going to do? We're victims of our own transparency. Um, uh, is the compensation study going to be done? Um, it's a, a calendar year till we get that. And then what's going to happen with county tax rate? And I haven't heard us talking about what is internally our responsibility. And yes, there was a board of super, or a superintendent um, task force study done here, but it's still our budget. And everything we're talking about are external factors instead of where we're concentrating our discussion. I'm very nervous about the fact that now the the um, deficit number is 70 million, and I look at two figures there, step increase and MSA, and shockingly, that's 72 and a half million. And so it, it, it just becomes a question of, well, you know, are we just gonna shrug our shoulders, you know, come May and say, well, we couldn't do it again. It's like we're, we're retreading the same ground over and over again instead of going back to what are the priorities of this board, where are we going to make the priorities. There are exigent circumstances every year, whether it's VRS, whether it's cuts, whether it's loss of employees, whether it's increased state funding but l less county funding. And I, 
the, the conversation has got to start turning inward around how we, as 12 members of this board, are going to adopt and make this budget our budget in order to answer the existing known changes. And then if there is the fluidity that Dr. Garza brought up or that uh, Ms. McLaughlin brought up, which does inevitably exist, then you make the changes in response to the fluidity. But we're not holding our breath, hoping the county will increase homeowners taxes five cents more, hoping that the state will come through with additional money, hoping that there'll be you know, an understanding from the JLARC study that there's some different formula that's gonna have to happen, that the LCI is gonna magically be you know, readjusted when the report just came out that for the first time in, I believe, decades, there's fewer people coming into Virginia than are leaving. So that does not purport well for long-term budget growth at the state level. So, you know, I don't know where the students are. I don't know the accuracy of these student numbers, once again, compared to what we've historically projected at this time of the year to what actually happens. And this should be a, a standard table that has a rolling forward set of columns that is a known quantity on how accurate this is. And instead, you know, I've got some rather large numbers and I've got a very big deficit that went from 100 million to 80 million to 70 million and I've got a $72 million figure up there that, you know, has got, is that the priority? And if it is the priority, then I want to hear discussion around that, not around what all the other elected bodies are doing. And the comment at the beginning, Ms. Michael, that, that the governor has education as the highest priority of funding, has the governor said that? Because I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know that I can count on what the governor says translating into actual dollars. That's the on the wing and a prayer approach to budgeting instead of the pragmatic approach to us solving it, are the 41.6 and the 31 our priority and then everything else falls away and that's a zero based budget that we build up ourselves um, sitting down with our departments. So that's my suggestion is that we stop talking about what everybody else is doing and start talking about what we're going to do. Okay, I have Mrs. Smith next. <clears throat> Ah, so I think the reality of um, this whole discussion and process is that there are moving pieces. There are parts we control and that we don't control and that we are in a process and that we have talked to the public about deficits and what we need to do. And I, I think what I hear from my colleagues is these are things we don't want to do. We don't want to have a discussion of a budget that we are going to change the face of Fairfax County. And so I think that does tend to lead the discussion to the fact of what can we expect and hope for with the revenue. But I think this superintendent and this board are definitely prepared to come forward with a budget in that January time frame that's going to reflect our best knowledge and, and what we see is going to happen. And yes, this board said in May when we voted on the budget that employee compensation is a priority. And I heard the superintendent say just a little while ago that if other things have to go in the budget, then that's where the budget will be developed, but employee compensation is a priority. And, you know, for those of us that have been doing this for a long time, there, there's that knowledge, and you have to explain it to the community, that these numbers will change, the projections will change, but our projections on student enrollment have been pretty good since 2008, and this is just part of the process, and it will get better when you get closer to the time of where the kids are. Um, I'm happy we're involving the community. This is not going to be easy. I hope that we can all pull together and, and not have some of these discussions, and I'm not gonna name any items now that might have to be cut from this budget, mm -hmm. But this is a tough job we have ahead of us. And we all hold this school system dear to our hearts. And we're going to do the best we can do. Um, but it is, it is inches and months in time until we know we're 
parts of the pieces fall out, and, and I think it's good we're having these discussions and we're involving the community. Um, but I, I respect the work, I respect the numbers we see here, and you know that we inform the community that this does change. Dr. Garza. Um, yes, just, just for clarity purposes, because I think we always have to work hard to be really clear and concise in what we're saying. The, the deficit in our projections is technically has gone from 134.8 million to 126.4 million. And we've always subtracted what we felt we could anticipate from the county transfer. The budget guidance is 3%, and so the, the deficit has always exceeded 100 million, but we're recognizing the fact that we're gonna potentially get 3%, and so that's always been 80. We've always shown it that way. You go back to the spring, we've shown it that way, and we'll continue to update it. Um, Ms. Schultz is correct. We'll continue to monitor enrollment. We will make adjustments in the fall. You all remember that we'll bring you updates as we know more on that. Um, and the critical work also, as she just said, we've got to get busy. And so we sh talked about the cut process even this past June as we talked about the task force and our timeline for this work. Um, today we're going to get into that. We're going to give you an update on what the task force has been doing. But ultimately, at the end of the day, as I've said many, many times, the decision rests with this board, the superintendent and this board. So we uh, will begin that process in just a few minutes. We'll be talking about the menu of, of cuts. We're going to be suggesting all of you develop a budget. Uh, we've got to start doing that work now, and that will begin intently over these next few months. Um, I certainly want to present a budget on January the 7th that reflects not only what we've heard from the community, but first and foremost, what you all want that budget to reflect in terms of cuts. Um, so that, that work will begin immediately after we finish talking about the, the um, fiscal forecast. Okay, Mr. Stork to be followed by Mrs. Reed. Mr. Stork. Uh, thank you. I think from my perspective, the big picture here is what we're really focused on right now anyways. And the big picture isn't plus or minus a couple million dollars or even plus or minus, I guess, 10 million or 20 million dollars. It's plus or minus a very large number that I think this board at least has been wrestling with for some time as to how do we address this. And, and the big picture part of this is either finding um, substantial reductions, i.e. in the order of you know, 70 to 100 million dollars in our system, or looking at um, paying our employees less than what we at least identified was our priority last year. Um, I think there are clearly other opportunities there, but they're, they're small in the big picture. Right now, to me, this is a big picture conversation. You know, you have revenues, you have expenses, and unless people think our expenses are grossly exaggerated by 70 to 100 million dollars in some way or other, or there's some way that we can do that more easily than what has been identified, and if they are, then please, I wish any board member here to bring that up. I wish any community member to bring that up. Because frankly, that is what is at stake in the system right now. And that is, and needs to be the conversation that, we be ha that we're having with everybody this fall. It's that simple. You know, some people are gonna say the schools shouldn't get more money and other people are gonna say we think the schools do need more money. And while it's not a right or wrong, there is a continuum there. We, the conversation is about whether or not we are gonna keep the school system as we know it for the last, I would say 20 or 30 years. And I'll defer to Janie for, for the really more that assessment. But there's no doubt that we have a core discussion here that we're taking, that we're following right now. I appreciate the superintendent, superintendent's task force. I think it helps to kind of focus our conversation on what really is possible and where that really exists. Again, I think there's opportunities to, to cut here and there, but they're not gonna be significant. They're definitely not gonna be $70, $100 million unless we're talking about uh, employee wages given it represents 90% of our budget. So. Uh, to me, that's what I'm staying focused on is this is the next kind of conversation, next um, iteration of the budget. There'll be pluses or minus in each one of these as we, we go along. But the core number hasn't changed since for over a year, from my, from my knowledge. We've been talking about the 2017 budget being a huge and a major kind of decision point for Fairfax County residents and, and all of us as to what do we want out of our school system, what do we want in the way of a school system. That's my conversation with voters. That's my conversation with any time I talk about this is 
yes, there's opportunities to save, but the, the, the core of it is, do you want the school system to look like it is today? Or do you want it to look like a Prince William County school system, which, where they've made choices that are different, they spend less money, but it's not what we have come to at least expect and believe is what our school system should be in Fairfax County. So let's have that conversation. I really want that conversation, but it is a, a gross level expenses and revenue conversation. So let's keep having it and let's make sure we're talking to our constituents about it. Let's make sure we educate them that unless somebody has some kind of magic wand that they can come up with 70, $100 million or some variation of that, I don't, I don't see anything other than the choices that we've been talking about more broadly. So um, let's, let's stay, keep our focus at that level because the numbers will change within it. I understand that pro part of the process. Mrs. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Velkoff. Uh, this has been, I think, a very uh, productive uh, initial discussion, and I agree with Mr. Stork. We have a lot more discussing to do. Uh, and focusing in right now, at least, on the big picture, I wanted to acknowledge both Ms. McLaughlin and Mrs. Schultz. And I think what they were getting at is the issue of the integrity of the data. And so to, to their points, I think it's very important that we can at least take a look at our historical data when it comes to some of these data points, just to make sure that we're kind of you know, on track relative to the prior years, you know, just to give us a better sense for where these numbers are coming from. And regarding the accuracy of the projections, the same thing. I mean, we're doing that, of course, on the facilities construction side of the house, too, with our projections, right? So um, I would hope that that would be something that we could easily get and that would help because a lot of people in the public don't understand, oh, oh that's a fluffy number. So I think it would help our case to be able to say, you know, just, you know, again, very simply, here's the historical data. And, and prove the point. And also, it gives us as board members a little information when someone says to us, what does this number mean, this enrollment in, in $22 million? I want to be able to have the information to speak intelligently about that. So um, I think it would be helpful to have the base savings and health care costs historically and the accuracy data on enrollment. And I think that would be pretty easy for staff to, to collect. Um, but I think the bigger point here is that we do need a conversation, I think, amongst ourselves as a board as well as with the public on some of these big picture issues. For example, a needs-based budget. What does that mean? I mean, as a board, I'm not sure that we've ever collectively had a public discussion about that. Does that mean what, what we really think we need to, to ask for? Does it mean it should be a realistic budget based on we, what we believe we're going to be getting or something in between or something else? I don't know. But I think we need to talk about that. Wants versus needs. I think when we get into this next discussion about the menu, um, I'm hopeful that that'll tee up the discussion on wants versus needs. And as I look at some of these materials, um, I would love to see um, just kind of going ahead and hinting where I'm going, for, going to, and that is that I think we need to start indicating what's absolutely required versus what we have no choice in doing and some of these activities, like strategic plan investments. I know it says to be determined, but I think, you know, my view on that one was that, oh, you know, we're going to be maybe supplanting some of the activities that we're doing now and substituting them with strategic plan activities. It's not going to be new things that we're doing. So that's just one example of how I think we need to look at what the assumptions are and what's behind some of these things and discuss them as a board. And last but not least, the issue of save F FCPS. I don't know if my colleagues have heard any reaction in the community. Um, I've heard mixed. Some people say yes. You know, we understand what the, what the superintendent is saying that we're really in a desperate scenario here. And then I hear others, frankly, who say, including some supervisors, a business, a potential business who looks at that and sees that says, oh, I don't know if I want to come to Fairfax. Or a potential teacher looks at that and says, uh-oh, I don't know if I want to jump on the Titanic. So I'm just saying that those are some of the things that I think as a board we need to discuss. As a board, will we have a position? Uh, on these kinds of things, or will, will we just independently kind of advocate as we see fit and, and talk to our communities? So that's all I wanted to say now, kind of just throwing out perhaps some discussion items that, uh, that I'm hopeful we'll get to as we continue to deliberate on the budget. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Dernett Koufax. Thank you. I don't have much to add to what my colleague said, but I just want to share with you my perspective. I, I don't have any questions. Um, 
I really do appreciate what Dr. Garza and her team are doing now. Um, I think um, engaging the community with the task force makes absolute total sense because as Mr. Stork had stated, these are numbers which we have known about for a while. We knew what the projections were and it makes no sense to um, create a budget in a vacuum when we all, at least the engaged members of the public have known quite a while that 2017 was going to be a very, very difficult year for us, given the guidance which we've been given, the 3%, and knowing the increases that were coming. So I do appreciate where we are. As Ms. Smith said, it, it is quite painful when you look at that budget tool and what's there. I, I don't find any of those choices as a parent in the system for what I want for my child. I don't find any of them agreeable, to be quite honest. Um, it's, it is not the fair facts that my children have grown up with, and it is not the fair facts that I'm sure those of you who have kids have gone through and have grandchildren currently in the system and or people who have kids coming up want. And that speaks a bit to Ms. Reed's points. Do, you know, this Fairfax, we know it's a brand for this county. And we want to ensure we all live here and we all want maybe to retire here and continue to bring up our children here. And we don't want, it's never our desire to deflate that brand, but we have to be real. Um, as far as Ms. Schultz, I, I think the historical data, when I sat on um, Supervisor McKay's budget task force, I did ask for those numbers at one point, um, the accuracy, and I do believe they were, they were quite on point, um, but I think those numbers need to be updated because that's a question I asked about five years ago, so I think we, we, we do need to do that. And when we talk about... I don't know, Ms. Reed, when you talked about needs-based, I think part of, you know, because we all see different needs, but, but you know, a fiscally responsible budget would, would have for years now had dollars and, and the county al allocating dollars for us for pre-K funding because we're spending so much cost later on in remediation and all of those things when every data point indicates if you invest early, you save money later yet we've never been willing to do that. So is that a need or a want? I would say it's a, it's a prudent need, right? So, and, and you talk about innovative programming. I, I think, Ms. Hines, you, you um, helped me. And could you just one more time reiterate for me, because I didn't get all of them, the unfunded needs as to where, when you, when you say um, that's TBD. Uh, right now, what, what are you talking about? I have pre-K student technology, and what were the other ones? So we had pre-K, we had reducing our class sizes. Okay. Infrastructure, both in terms of preventative maintenance, replacement equipment, right? They're all included in the budget overview presentation. This is a link in board docs. This okay. is the community presentation that we've been using um, right. as we go out to the community right. yes, meetings. I have that. It's on page 20. It has a list of the unfunded needs. Okay. And per those page go 20. through. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sam, my comments. So everyone's had a chance to speak, so I'll say a couple of things, and then we'll have a couple of go-backs. We're trying to finish the entire session by 1230, and there's still some more stuff that we want to present, which is very important. Um, I want to thank you, um, Kristen and Carol, for the, um, the pink estimates indicating the, um, that these are a little bit more volatile. Uh, from my training as a software engineer, um, I was taught uh, never give an estimate without uh, a level of confidence in the estimate, and this is a, a, a good step forward for us. Um, I think actually you're, uh, again, becoming uh, a victim of your own transparency because what it seems what seems to be happening here is we're looking at items that have uh, volatility and then we're saying well if that number is volatile well then it invalidates the entire thing let's be a little let's be a little sensible here so let's take let's take the student enrollment 22 million dollars so what do you think the margin of error is suppose it's a hundred percent suppose they are completely wrong that's $22 million. We still have almost $50 million to go. So let's keep it in perspective. And if it's 5%, 
that's a million dollars. Okay, so let, let's just be careful how we're using those estimates. Okay, so there are a couple of go-backs. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. McLaughlin, and then um, Mrs. Strauss. So I think maybe looking at this at a very macro level and at the work that Dr. Garza has really tried to help prepare our community for, in, in thinking about what Mr. Velkoff just said, the volatility, there's things we just, we don't know what's gonna happen with our state funding. That, that alone, you know, we're, we're looking at 71.6 million. Well, if Governor McAuliffe comes through with the General Assembly, that number gets carved down could be even better. Maybe we're, we're now looking at 50, as Dr. Garza said, windfall of 20 million. Bear in mind, now what we're looking at is we had a community conversation of we may be facing 100 million, now we're down to 50. That's great for our community, but bear in mind, it has been difficult then for the community to wrap its brain around when, wait a minute, I thought we, we were at 100 million, now we're at 50. So I kind of want to move away as board members from always trying to label what that number looks like. I think we are better off talking about what do we know hard and fast we're gonna need. We know without question that we're gonna need about $70 million to match what the county wants to give its employees that we wanna make sure we give to ours. So if we focus in on those numbers and, and quite frankly, again, as sort of a maybe a, maybe it's not radical, it feels a little radical, but this board member feels like, as far as I'm concerned, if Dr. Garza comes in January and says to me, you know what, here's the budget I'm giving you guys, and I'm not budging off of it, which is I got to be able to cover the employee raise because Ed Long still says 4% on his side of the envelope, so I'm putting 4% on mine. And I got health care increases. They're there. They just have to be there. And um, the other number that I'm looking at that's been driving, and the VRS. Very real, it's gonna happen, gotta do it. In my mind, the squishy, the squishy number is gonna be the new student enrollment. I don't wanna tackle that today, but I want you to know when I look at those three numbers alone, this board member would fully support Dr. Garza saying, so long as Ed, Gar Ed Long still telling the public, this is where I'm looking at my budget, we can then, in very good faith to the public, say, yep, we went to the board supervisor saying, we're matching you, and if, and if that comes out that it looks like, well, that's nice school board, but how are you gonna do that on the 3% we promised you? Then we'll say, no, that's really for you guys as the funding authority. The reason I'm going through that exercise is I think rather than us getting called to the mat, and that's how I feel with some of the supervisors saying, what are you guys doing over there? Hashtag save SPS, you got a hundred million dollars. You know, you're, you're really sending up this warning sign. In my mind, it's like, all right, fine. Then let's just go with the fact that we want fair and equitable. That our budget matches what you plan to be doing for your employees. And now you need to answer to this county how all the employees get made whole. In, in terms of then the cuts, we still go together with the board of supervisors and say, fund Fairfax County like you're supposed to. But um, I, 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 I'm worried a little bit that we have focused so much on what the deficit number will look like, and that is changing. That's just a reality. And Mr. Vilkoff, I agree with your compliment to staff. They're doing the best they can. But there's some real fluctuation here that we have to be mindful of now that could be more problematic if we keep focusing on that number versus just what we know we need. The, the fluctuation, I think, is a point that we've been sensitive to because, you know, people will throw stones at us for that. That's why we've been very careful that we've said up to $100 million before the county transfer. Go look at anything we've talked about. We've also said that's why we were developing a number of scenarios because this is a very fluid process. So the budget task force, all the community documents, everything we've set out there is we're developing two scenarios. One, a $50 million cut, one, a $75 million cut. That way we're ready, you know, as these numbers get more stabilized, we have a plan. Okay, uh, Mr. Press would like to speak. I'll give him a chance to speak, and then we have three go-backs, and then we need to move on. So, Mr. Press, then we have Mrs. Strauss, then Ms. Schultz, and Mr. Moon. 
Mr. Press. Thank Perez. you, Mr. Velkoff. Um, well, I'm going to kind of change the tone here. I'm actually kind of smiling that we have, um, you know, that number is lower because in context, $8.4 million is a lot of money. That, you know, that to me means one program that we've helped to save. One pro, you know, one activity that a student now gets to participate in that he wouldn't maybe have been able to participate in in that $80 million scenario. So to me, this is, this is a positive. Um, but again, I, I kind of want to, we've had a very numbers-based discussion here today, which I guess is, you know, budget's all about. But we need to keep in mind the, the qualitative impact that these discussions are having. Um, and just how devastating $70 million can be. So you can look at that and say, okay, that's a drop in the pond out of a $2.3 billion budget. But those are, those are real things that we're cutting. I mean, these, the, we're talking getting rid of, you know, so, I mean, looking at that menu of options that the, that the budget task force put forward. Cutting sports. That, that's a million dollar cut, that's an eight million dollar cut, what, what, whatever level you may look, but that is a completely intangible sense of change that you're, you're, you're now inflicting upon our schools that we, you know, we have to reckon with, and that has to stay a part of the discussion because in, in some of these cases, to be brutally honest, you can't put the impact in words because you are completely changing the nature of our schools. Um, so, you know, my comment in this whole discussion is that while we, can, while we can look at numbers, we need to take the qualitative aspect of every cut we're proposing into account, um, you know, as we, as we make the decisions moving forward. Mrs. Strauss. Um, thanks. The issue of accuracy of student enrollment stuff, we, that's a bunch of questions that have been asked every year. It's also a question that's asked every year for the CIP. Um, if I were swift, I would pull up that answer right now. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm still dealing with, can I see? Um, so that, and, and every year the answer uh, in the aggregate is we are within about 1% or a little less. Um, school by school, we are looking granularly because the issue is, is there's just simply get interesting piece. One of my schools has 34 kids more than what we projected, and it's because of a development project in the community that we assumed wasn't going to come online. The developer has very cleverly got one house up and has guaranteed that he will have 30 houses up by Christmas. And we have to take the kids, and we're going, really? But, you know, you, we can't control that. I have another school that is down by about 10, but we think those 10 kids are in the neighboring school. So that's the fluctuations that we can't, we simply can't control. We get the first enrollment count in October, the end of October, correct? And that's what we, and then we look again. That's basically what our baseline becomes for the first cut on the budget. We get the special ed count in December, and that's a tough one. And then we project again in March, and again in April, and again in June. And that's done every single year. And if you look in every school's profile on their profile page, you can compare their enrollment, special ed, AAP, general ed, grade by grade, going back for as many years as you can go. Plus, we have our one benchmark page in the budget. I forget what page it is every year. You can go back 30 years and be able to absolutely look at growth of positions, growth of budget, growth of enrollment, and you can see how accurate or not it is there every single year. So, but our problem is kids come, and they come all throughout the year, and there is no way, and as Dr. Dargaz says, we take every single child. That is our job. But somebody will very quickly pull up that answer. How are we every year? It's, we ask that question every single year. And to the, for, the, for the community, for the Board of Supervisors, we adjust those every single time we count noses every single time, and it's a public number. Thanks. Ms. Schultz. Well, I hate to categorically disagree with my colleagues, but I will, because what was just said is not true. You are referring to the numbers that we publish in the spring to the numbers that come in the fall as the 1% difference, not the numbers that come out when we start talking about the CIP or we start talking about the budget in the previous fall. And being able to predict who's coming to what school in September when it's April or May is, and, and be within 1% um, is a meaningless projection. 
being able to project years out. And Ms. Strauss, your example is precisely the example that highlights what I'm talking about, is if there are 34 students um, additional in one school, and each of those 34 students is in one classroom, they don't cost the school system 10,000 more per student, which is precisely why Mr. Velkoff's uh, accuracy on the 22 million is incorrect, because the 22 million assumes that every one of those students costs an additional $10,000 to the system. And if they don't cost a, a base amount to the system because we don't know where they're coming. Now, those children be, could be coming in some of our poorest areas and cost exponentially more than $10,000 per student. And so if they cost more, I'm not, I'm not asking for a response. If, they're, if they cost more because of where they're coming and the type of student, like the exponential increase in ESOL kindergarten students that we have seen, those students don't cost the same as another student. And that is why the accuracy, not only in the numbers in the out years, has to be improved, but where they're coming and who they are. And it is something I've advocated for five years because if we don't get the numbers right, everything else is wrong thereafter. If you and go it, into the school profile, Ms. Strauss, Ms. Strauss, Ms. Strauss, no thank you. I, it's why we've had a 7% growth in population in the last decade and an 18.5% growth in trailer usage. We're up to almost 1,000 trailers. We have 931 trailers, and the most trailers are in the poorest areas because we have the lowest classroom sizes. And so it does matter that the accuracy is reflected not from the spring to that fall, but years out to improve the accuracy by school rate so that if we add, if 10 kids move from one school to another school, you know what? They didn't cost us any more money. So the, the accuracy of the numbers at a macro level is insignificant in terms of the impact on the budget who those children are, whether we have facilities to house them, whether we're gonna have to wedge in more kids into classrooms. Like I have some schools where the smallest classroom is 25 students, the smallest classroom. It goes up from there. Or we're getting into facility costs. All of those are impacts to the budget. And if we don't get to a micro level of accuracy on that, and I can't even ask, we're not talking about accuracy rate from the CIP to that fall. I'm talking about the numbers from here to the following fall, a year out. Those numbers are not 1%. Okay, we have uh, Mr. Moon to be followed by Ms. Evans. Let's really try to wrap this up here. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Welkoff. I, I don't want to be labeled on accuracy of enrollment projection at this point, but when we say that additional $22.1 million for enrollment growth, it's not just number of additional students, but that also we also look into demographic change of entity entire student population of 190000 close to $190,000, and that is why it's not $10,000 for additional student coming into school system. Am I not correct? You are correct, and in the approved budget on page 223, we show a chart that shows where that cost of $22.1 million was calculated in this current school year. So it goes through and says that increase in students and all of those changes in student demographics, what additional positions were then required at schools. So that breakout is on and page I just hope that all board members do understand that point as we go out to the community to further educate if there is anyone who does not you know, to have a true understanding, of, accurate understanding of what that represents. Having said that, uh, on the budget task force, I think our first discussion on the budget task force and its work was held in June of this year. And then we had another work session on the budget task force, then update in July. And in those two work sessions, I didn't hear from board members that we should not be doing this. It's, it's a, it's a, 
uh, just unsettling in the community that we should not engage in community to prepare for potential budgetary adjustments we need to make to prepare for FI17. I don't know whether any board member at this point is suggesting that we should stop the work. I'm not a one board member you know, asking that budget task force should not continue its work, but rather it is you know, very refreshing to see that we are, we are trying to engage as much as possible our community in working together to overcome the challenges ahead of us. And let me just ask you one question that since the Board of Supervisors Advisors Ultimate Funding Authority, from my perspective, does not make a decision until uh, later part of April, like April 21, 22nd, that time frame, if we have to make any position cuts, we have to, if we have to prepare for the position cuts, isn't there a statutory deadline by which we need to notify our employees? Yes, we do have a deadline. Um, however, that was extended. Um, I think during the last um, reduction in force process, I think that was extended from April, I want to say, sometime in end of May or early June. Okay. Okay, thank you. But obviously, for the planning of the school year, it's very late in the process because we've gone through the hiring process for next year, so everything would have to be on pretty much on hold all through late winter, early spring, when as we're planning for the following school year. Because if you kind of look through the timeline, that's when we're hiring for next year. So if we don't know where we're going to be come next September on positions, that makes planning for next school year very difficult. OK, thank you. All right, Ms. Evans. I just wanted to say something about the uncertainty in the enrollment figures because we have a different um, situation in some parts of our county than we do in others. And I, as much as we all want as accurate data as we can, there is uncertainty built in because there's human behavior built into this. And I, Mrs. Schultz is right that some students simply cost more than others because of their... Uh, the, the level that they come, uh, level of education that they come to us with. If you look at back to 2008, I don't know who could have predicted that bubble bursting and people doubling and tripling up into homes and uh, the increase in number of students. So um, I just want us to be very careful. I, we, we want the best projections we can. I think our principals do a fine job of going out into the community and trying to determine exactly how many students they're going to have coming in the next year. But um, what, what we see and increasingly see uh, in my part of the world is students coming in throughout the year. It's not just September that our students are coming in. They come in in October. They come in in December. We have students who arrive in May and say, I'm going to be here tomorrow. You know, we just do, particularly when they come from other countries and that are on different school cycles. We have students who come in um, at the end of their school year, which is uh, not the end of, of, our, of ours. Um, so um, I, I just want us to be aware of that when we talk about the, um, the projections. I, I, I think we do the best we can, but five years out, we're dealing with not only human behavior, we're dealing with economics, and in some cases, we're dealing with international political situations. And uh, it's time to move on to the next section. I just do want to clarify for the public <clears throat> that uh, our growth is not exponential. If it were, we'd have like a billion people in Fairfax County. If, if I could lead into the, if I could lead into the task force uh, update, we have Matt Hagley here who uh, graciously agreed to help us chair this committee. I don't know that he um, recognized the magnitude of that that job when we asked him to help us, <laughs> um, but he had, he and the entire committee has done yeoman's work. Um, they've taken the work very seriously. Um, and they've been putting lots of time and energy uh, into into the work. So I'm deeply grateful, particularly, you know, certainly to all the members, but particularly to Matt Haley, uh, for for take for 
really uh, doing uh, great work with this. Um, the work is is um, the initial list of menus of uh, the menu of considerations uh, was developed using um, user voice. You all remember we've used user voice. We've selected and, and collected information from the community. That's been fed to the task force. Uh, we'll again ask you for your ideas if there are, um, are ideas you have that are not reflected on that list. We need to have those ASAP because it does take staff time to, to um, quantify those and be able to project the savings associated with that. So I know that uh, Ms. Reed and Mr. Belkoff I think we're going to make a plea for you to kind of weigh in and get busy. Now's the time to do that. Um, we will continue to have numerous work sessions over the coming months. Uh, but if you have ideas that are not reflected, we need to have those now. Um, the task force, when we t started talking about this last, I guess, June, May, June, um, we, we know that this task ahead of us is going to be very difficult. And we were all very interested in having the community weigh in and for the community to have a voice. So the task force was one opportunity for multitude of lay people, in fact, you all appointed folks to that committee, plus other stakeholders that were invited. Um, they had this unique opportunity to delve just a little deeper into the budget than, than most lay people, although they're not budget experts. Uh, many of them have great budget and a finance, financial experience, but uh, we don't expect them necessarily to be an expert on FC, FCPS's budget. But it provides us, the task force, along with these many community meetings that we've begun having and many more that are ahead, um, to have the community kind of that lens. How might the community want us to address this issue? What do they want us to take in consideration? How might they um, kind of prioritize or rank uh, these items? Um, at the end of the day, I think we've been pretty clear that it's our decision, um, and certainly you all have experience. Uh, our, you know, we've had experience that may they may not have uh, a deep understanding of impact, um, and so certainly we have to weigh in some larger issues, but I think we're all very interested in what the community has to say because uh, these are their schools. And so, again, I want to thank Matt, and our team has worked very hard to keep uh, the Budget Task Force well apprised and updated of information. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, I know that's uh, lots of varied perspectives, and I think that's representative of our community, right? The varied pr perspectives that we've seen. So I'm going to let the team, I don't know who's going to kick this off. Okay, Kristen's going to kick this off in terms of an update. In addition to Matt, we also have many other um, budget task force members here in the audience, um, and including Ben. So I just wanted to make sure we acknowledge all of them that are here today as well as participating on the task force. So giving you an update since we last discussed this in July, the budget task force has met six times, including an additionally scheduled meeting that was added for August 20th. In addition to that, in order to complete their work, the task force has adjusted their delivery of their final recommendations to Dr. Garza from October 7th to October 15th. And it's going to be adding that October 7th as a work day. And we'll be providing you with an updated calendar. The calendar that's posted for this work session doesn't show that additional October 15th date. So during its meeting on August 4th, the task force considered and finalized the list of the prudential reductions that would be included in the budget proposal tool. So those items in that tool came from user voice, other recommendations that we received. Then on August 20th, um, staff presented the task force with additional information about questions that they had been asking us. And we've posted that for today as attachment number four. Um, all of the information for the budget task force is posted on their website, but we wanted to ensure that you saw that information. Many of the items included in that document include comparisons with cost per pupil or cost per pupil over time, has information in terms of our non-school-based positions and efficiencies, reductions taken to date, information about our students per classroom teacher, the budget bookmark that was shared at the leadership conference, information on student enrollment and demographics. It has the chart on employee compensation. And then there are two pages of information on retirement. So we had received many questions from the task force. So we had provided them with additional information that really um, addresses some specifics in terms of VRS, ERFC, and then the county's retirement plan 
and also includes a summary chart. So that information is, is posted for the task force. Um, at the same time, budget staff then demonstrated the budget proposal tool to the task force, and we'll talk more about that as we go through today. Prior to showing you guys on the website how you can access all of this information, we did want to give an update on the two community information meetings that we held. So to assist both the superintendent and the budget task force, we held a community information meeting on September 9th at South Lakes High School and on September 12th at Mount Vernon High School. As part of that presentation, we first showed attendees a video um, about FCPS's budget. Then we went through and gave them a presentation and answered questions about that presentation. The responses back to the questions that we weren't able to answer at that session will be completed and posted online. We also provided people at that community information meeting with all the tools that they would need to complete the budget proposal tool online. We're going to show all of those to you in just a minute. Um, all of the materials for the tool and the task force and the community meetings are online. Just to give you an update, as of Friday to date, we had received 150 submissions, individuals in the budget proposal tool. So that's 850 individual people, not 850 submissions. Oh, eight, <laughs> 850 people submitted proposals. Ongoing. Those numbers have been increasing day by day by day. So just in a couple of days more. Sorry. <laughs> so next, during the task force meeting on September 16th, just to bring you up to date, the task force did look at some preliminary data from the budget proposal tool. And then as they work forward on September 30th and October 7th, they're going to be working on consensus building in terms of developing their recommendations and finalizing what they'll recommend to the superintendent in terms of their final report. Um, so what I would like to do is to show you how you can access um, this information online. So if you go to the main FCPS webpage, fcps.edu, you'll see at the bottom of the page is where the budget update is. And you can click there and it's going to take you to our webpage. So this is where you can access the budget proposal tool. It's in the center of the page, the budget video. Um, when you move down on the page, the links that you'll be able to see are the budget overview. That's that two-page budget summary flyer that we handed out at the community information meetings. So that'll share that flyer with you. We also have the budget presentation that we used at the community meetings. It's the overall budget presentation focusing primarily on the operating fund. It has a little bit of the construction fund. For those of you that were unable to attend the community uh, sessions, I think you could ask some of your colleagues. I think the staff did a great job on that budget presentation. So if you need a tool or need, that's just some good information for you as you're out in the community. So I would really encourage you to take a moment to study the budget presentation because I think it is a great, a great tool for board members. <laughs> We also have right on this page a link to the budget task force. That's where you'll get to all the information that's posted for the task force. When you go to the task force site, we have posted it by topic, but we also have a link at the bottom that will let you see the information by date. And then lastly on this page, we also have the budget development timeline and links to how to contact your elected officials. So what we'd like to do is just talk a little bit more about the budget proposal tool so if we'll go there first, when you click on the budget proposal tool page, it's gonna take you to this main budget proposal tool page. And what this does is it provides both instructions and some background context for people as they begin to use the tool, right? This is the information that we shared as part of the community meeting in a text format. On the top right side of the page, we also have links that will take you to information that you'll also find helpful. So right there are the instructions for using the tool. We created a glossary, so for terms that are inside the tool, for community members to understand those terms, the glossary link is there. We also have long-term considerations and many other items that we think you'll find useful as you work through the tool. So one of the things that we included is we have a printout of all of the items in the tool. So we'll go ahead now and we'll open the budget proposal tool. We just wanted to briefly show it to you. The last time we showed it to you, it was in a preliminary version. Remember, we had some text cells in there. So we wanted you to be able to see it. I really encourage each of you to try it, right? For me, 
trying to come up with decisions of my own that got me to addressing even a $50 million deficit were, were really difficult. So even if you don't want to submit it, I really do encourage you to go through and try that proposal because um, I, I think it's, it's enlightening. So when you open the budget proposal tool, we have again at the top that link back to the instructions. So if you want to ask questions, you're not quite sure, you can always go back to the instructions or access the glossary. So what community members will do is all of the potential reductions are located in the bottom half of the page and they're sorted by category. So the tiles have different colors. So I encourage you and, and all the citizens as I talk through, as they work through this, to look through all of the tiles before you begin, right? If you drag an item into your proposal and you change your mind and don't want it, you can remove it. But I found it helpful to look through them all first, which is where the printed vet printed version, which we posted as an attachment for the work session today, is very helpful. So what you'll do is you'll click and you'll drag on the item that you want to include in your proposal. And once you do that, if the item has multiple drop-down menus, you can then select the drop-down menu that corresponds with the level of that reduction that you want to implement. So when you select the option that you want, what you'll see is the deficit amount on the right side adjusts by the value of that tool. So we start out at first with a $50 million deficit. When you select your item, that deficit will continue to decrease. So you'll need to drag in multiple items in terms of addressing the deficit. If there's an item that you wanted to consider that's not in there, you have the ability to create your own item. right? And you can do that by selecting the user created option. So when you click user created option, a box is going to pop up and ask you to give that item a name. When you do, you can enter the name of the item. So let's say you want to reduce the market scale adjustment for employees. I know no one wants to, but this is an easy example. So when you put that text in, we've included in the instructions that the value of that market scale adjustment each half a percent is over $10.3 million. So you then drag or put that amount in the dollar box and click OK, save. So then what you do is you take your user created option and you drag it into your proposal. Right? At any point, if you decide an item in your proposal you no longer want, you have the ability to take it out of your proposal and it will fall to the bottom of the list. So it doesn't go back into its color coded placement, it falls to the bottom. So that way you know you looked at it and, and said no and moved it to the bottom. Once you get to within plus or minus 10% of the target, so in this case we started with a $50 million deficit, a box will pop up telling you that you can submit. So we wanted all of our proposals to be plus or minus 10%. When you're ready to submit, at the bottom of the screen it's going to ask you for information, including um, who you're representing, parent, community member, employee, your email address. If you provide your email address, we'll share with you the task force's final proposal. Um, and then we've also included your zip code, which will help with demographic information. After you submit your $50 million proposal, the tool will ask you if you would like to move on to the $75 million proposal. If you do, all of the items from your $50 million proposal are still in your proposal. So you'll continue to build from 50, moving on to 75. At the end, we ask users to complete a survey and, and give us feedback, which we'll use to enhance future versions of the tool if we use it again. And so far to date, over 80% of the people that have used the tool have said that it was easy to use. Um, so we have gotten some positive feedback in terms of using the tool. So the data from the tool will continue to provide regular updates of that data to the budget task force so they can use it as they're working to develop their consensus on their recommendations. Do you want to end? All right, fantastic. Thank you. Is there anything else? Okay. Sure, Mr. Haley. Just, uh, I'd like to add just a couple things to that. Um, there were some comments that we had received. So first of all, thanks for letting us brief you. Um, as Mr. Volkov said earlier, some of you may have uh, been aware that we had some transparency that caused some grief in the community. I apologize for that, but. Uh, it was still a good thing because we got uh, input, and input is what we care about. So I'd much rather have an unhappy email come to me than not hear from somebody. Um, but I apologize if we shocked some of you when we uh, let out information throughout the process, which I think still was a good thing, but perhaps we could have communicated better. 
Um, just so that you know, when we last talked, there were three deliverable um, uh, target um, cost savings, 50, 75, and 100. We've had two modifications to our deliverables. One is we are no longer going to be doing a $100 million cost cut. As you've seen the budget forecast as it stands right now, forcing people to make a set of cuts that are uh, unlikely to be used seemed unfair. To get the entire uh, task force, as you know, there are 36 people widely representative um, aligned. We've added uh, a set of appendices on uh, things that are not FY17, but people felt was important to share with uh, Dr. Garza and you as an organization. Um, they're at the same level as everything else. You may decide that uh, you don't like the ideas. You may decide you don't like the ideas, but we felt that it was important that as we've learned things, we share ideas that perhaps are not FY17, but may be more strategic or longer term or are not uh, FCPS specific. Um, I got some feedback from some people that they thought the task force was overloaded by having too many staff members. Um, since we are striving for a, uh, it will not be unanimous, 36 people will not be unanimous, but we will have high correlation of our, uh, or high agreement in the, in the uh, results or what we propose. Um, it's been very helpful having staff members uh, on the task force because it's, we're not looking just to make the cuts. We obviously want to understand the impacts. You may well understand them better than we do. Uh, but task force members having six principals, having five teachers, and a bus driver, and, 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 has, ex has been extremely helpful. Uh, they're not dominant, uh, but they are uh, responsive to questions, and it has saved us a tremendous amount of time in what is the impact of, you know, I'm going to use a simple example, not a recommendation that we're going to make necessarily. We're not sharing any of those yet. But what's the impact of changing strings from fourth grade to fifth grade from a scheduling perspective? So as we look at adding constraints or as constraints have been added to the system, it's helpful for us to understand what are the impacts of those constraints on strings and orchestra in high school if we make a change in the fifth grade. Not saying what we're going to do, but it has helped us tremendously in having that information shared throughout the process. Um, the other thing, and this is a response to some of the comments from earlier, um, I've talked to WTOP, WNEW, Washington Post, and several of the local papers. These are reporters trained in asking questions, intelligent high school graduates that care about this topic, but probing. And the lexicon that um, people within the school system uses is not widely shared. So part of the communication process that we've had to have inside the task force is something that you have to share with the rest of the community. Uh, the language that's spoken by the professionals and by yourselves um, is not widely understood. And uh, there are certain words that are used uh, to have a particular education-based meaning that are not the definition, they are not the common English definition. It's not improper. Every uh, industry has terms of art. However, your terms of art, you have to explain to a little over a million people, which is slightly different than the terms of art that a lawyer might have to do with one or two people at a time. So I don't have the answer for how to do that, but I need you to understand that within the task force, that has been a tremendous uh, learning effort. It has helped us when we briefed uh, the press. Um, the WTOP meeting, which was supposed to be, uh, he said, two to three minutes, took a little over 30 minutes, and it was driving down to secondary and tertiary impacts, and it was sharing a lexicon. So I know I'm uh, going a little over since we started three minutes late. I apologize for that, but I thought it was important that something you've been talking about amongst yourselves, um, that basis is something that um, would be wonderful for you to uh, find some tools to do that, and we can certainly help. may not be a cut recommendation, but the efforts that we've gone through might be useful for you as well. And then finally, Mr. Belkoff, is one thing. You know, I, t I think that any time, I don't know of another school system in the country that has engaged the community to the level we have in this process. And I think the jury's still out whether or not it's successful or not. I think we'll have an opportunity to, to think about that later on as we complete this process. And um, I will tell you, it's very challenging to engage the community on something that's so complex. Um, but I think at the end of the day, what I hear more than anything is a level of appreciation that we're interested and that we're making a concerted effort. Now, right or wrong, I think, like I said before, we'll determine whether it was effective or not down the road, but I do think our community appreciates, at least what I've heard, they appreciate the fact that we're engaging them and we're asking them and we want to know what they have to say about this important issue. 
So we are a half hour behind time. Are there burning questions about the tool? I think we've sort of worn out the uh, policy issues about the budget. So, okay, so there are tool questions from Ms. McLaughlin and Mrs. Strauss and Ms. Schultz. Ms. McLaughlin. So one thing that going off of what Dr. Garza just said, I, I find this absolutely incredible what you and your team have done. And I think it will not only inform the public, it will be very helpful to us as board members and, um, and quite frankly, information we can bring to our supervisors about what the, some of these big cost drivers and line items are. Um, but one thought I had about, um, and, and maybe I'm posing this to the task force chairman, because I think Without question, as Dr. Garza said, we have wanted to make this beneficial to our school system and to our community, and in the engagement process can have such high value. But now that today's presentation, we've seen that the numbers are understandably fluid when you get funding from the state that is so unknown right now, and some of the other things that have already shifted for us. For the for not just the task force, but more importantly, the community that's now being given this budget tool. And our public statements have been, it could be up to 100 million. And now we're looking at it could be up to 50 to 70. Rather than, again, causing, uh, in my mind, um, confusion, where people might start saying, so where, where is your, your um, deficit number falling? Uh, um, being able to say to everybody, look, this, this budget toolkit, we are asking you to look at how would you cut 50, how would you cut 70, knowing that um, we have some funding coming from the state and or the board of supervisors that could change that. Maybe just emphasizing that a little bit more so that people, as they're engaging in this exercise, feel like, okay, and, and, you know, now I understand that it, it might not be as dire as what 100 million looked like, but yes, trying to even get to 50 is going to be a challenge, and Kristen really touched on that. But I just think this might be a way that people won't feel like their time and effort and energy is, well, wait a minute, I was so worried about that, and I went to 50, and or, or I was trying to find 80 to 100, and now it's different. I, I'm just, maybe the chairman of the task force might want to say something to that. I think this is one of the few places where um, the business community members on the task force and the school members differ greatly. Most of us that come from a business perspective, plus or minus 10% is the variability we work with, right? So I would be expecting at this point that I might have a five-year layout budget, but I would be doing sensitivity analysis on a plus or minus 10% a year out. Here we're at you know less than a third of that, and that's a huge number for from a school's perspective and when I'm talking to a principal plus or minus you know two or three percent is a huge percentage when I run a business plus or minus ten percent a year out is a trivial percentage right um, one of the one of the consulting groups I'm working with right now you know we're plus or minus a billion dollars on a four billion dollar decision for next year because right now that's all we know um, so I suspect that there's a wide variation in the community that you're speaking to and what the experience is. In the government space, the people on the task force from the government space, a couple of percent is a, is a very substantial percentage. People that are running um, businesses that are you know, tens or greater billions of dollars, um, five or ten percent is, is a sensitivity analysis a year out. That doesn't mean that either one of those is right, but it has been one of the issues within the task force is to try and explain what is a big number and what's not a big number. We have people that have said, you know, I think you should cut this kind of, you know, this expense, and it's $20,000, uh, or $25,000 was one of the examples. Like, great, now you give me another 4,000 of those, um, and I got my 100 million, right? Um, and then somebody else says, well, I'll just cut this one item of $41 million, because that gets me close to 50, but they don't necessarily understand the second or third order impacts of those. So I think within the task force itself, we've seen a microcosm of the community, and the numbers, the absolute numbers, aren't the hard thing. It's those second and tertiary impacts. 
Um, so we could, you know, if you told us we had to cut $250 million, we'd cut $250 million. You just wouldn't like those answers. Um, and we wouldn't either. Uh, but I think that's one of the huge uh, uh, differences within the task force itself is that a lot of us have experiences of, you know, cut 30% of this organization because the revenue didn't come in. Okay, I don't have any choice. Um, that's not what we're going to be doing. We're going to be coming back with 50 and 75. Okay, Mrs. Strauss. Being able to come together and recognize the difference between from a business sector, how this looks, from a school sector, I mean, for the first time, I feel as though we're not two trains crossing in the night. And that is such advancement. Just looking at the glossary of terms, because the, the amount of learning, I hope, by the entire community is just incredible. Um, I'm very grateful to the work that has been going on. And I think the credibility of the discussions, the tool is amazing. And every, every time that I've gone out and people have talked about using the tool, they said, it's startling, but it is such a good tool. I would hope that as a community that we help all sectors of the community and our colleagues on the Board of Supervisors to seriously consider tools like this so that we aren't two trains crossing in the night a lot of people well-meaning, but lack of understanding of what it actually means to make the decisions, the impact, the glossary itself is just fabulous. So you guys are, are doing just valuable work for the schools and I think valuable work for the county. Thank you. Ms. Schultz. My question isn't so much on the tool, but more on that reference when you're talking about the lexicon, you know, the, the, the nuanced understanding that some either within staff or the board are using that are not, don't particularly translate to the public. Can you give us a couple of examples? Because, you know, that helps us, you know, uh, on the public engagement side, be, have clarity in our discussions. I'm going to use two vastly different examples, if, if that's okay. Um, one is when we talk about preschool, we're not, we instantly go to a three, four, or five letter acronym which doesn't necessarily communicate, is this a mandatory program? Is this a special education preschool? Um, what, what is this type of preschool versus that type of preschool? So we instantly go, or the school system communication goes from preschool to three different characteristics without any of those being defined very clearly unless you find the glossary in the back of the program manual or the program budget. So it's there, but the assumption is that everybody knows what uh, FSEP means or what something else means. When we do, yeah, there you go. See, so I have to look them up still because I'm not smart enough to remember them all. Um, but that's the, uh, there's an, a simple example where um, rational people that are trying to understand um, have to go back and forth. Um, we do the same thing with uh, elementary education. So what's immersion, what's elementary foreign language education, and so uh, it's probably intuitively obvious to all of you what's meant. And the second order effect of if I cut this kind of education, I don't save any money simply because we're using that time for planning time. But if I save this other time, then I save supplemental uh, teachers that are going in at the fourth grade because people have moved to AAP. Well, those second order effects are not intuitively obvious when I look at foreign language in elementary school. And the other kind of uh, lexicon difference is, some, is simply the word cut. Right? We use cut for two different meanings, it appears, and, and rationally. Um, when I tried to explain forbearance to a, a, a reporter, I found that that was a non-productive communication. Um, so it's not that he or she doesn't understand or couldn't be informed on that, but they're never going to use that word in a 45-second clip on WTOP. So we use the word cut to simply mean in central. If I have fewer people than before, it's a cut. If in a school I have more children per teacher, I am providing fewer services, um, and therefore I have cut the amount of services. One might mean that I have fewer people. The other mean I would simply mean I have fewer than I would have otherwise had. That simple word, it's a three-letter word, it's a you know, first-grade spelling word, has two totally different meanings, and the next level of understanding requires either accounting knowledge or 
45 seconds to a minute to explain the word cut, and they may not get it at the end of that, and you have to go into some examples. Um, you know, there are literally dozens of those. We generated a glossary. Uh, I heard a little comment about, you know, we've been pushing a little bit. We've pushed the additional glossary simply because um, it wasn't, you know, I'm a reasonable business guy. I couldn't read some of the terms and know whether it what it meant. Therefore, I couldn't ask what an impact question was because I didn't know what the word meant. I understood the numbers, didn't understand the, the, the context of the word, and therefore didn't understand second and third order effects. So that's very important because basically, um, I think there's a secret decoder ring um, that helps um, translate a lot of what we talk about in such a way that it becomes, um, uh, you know, um, more imprintable in the minds of the public who are trying to understand something that we deal with, you know, in spades, but they're, you know, doing a deep dive once on this. And so that's very, very helpful. I appreciate those examples. Mrs. Reed. I'll be brief because I know we're running out of time here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, for all your work on this tool and on the budget task force. The tool is fantastic. I, just, I have a question for my colleagues. How many of you have gone in there and played with it yet? Okay, so most of us, not everybody. I'll tell you what, my first observation is that there are only so many big rocks. <laughs> right? So just to your point, Matt, I mean, you could take all these little things all day long and you're never going to get there. So to that point, I would urge my colleagues to... Um, to try to be thoughtful and see if we can come up with other suggestions. Dr. Garza mentioned that a little bit ago, but I, I think it's worth reiterating. Um, if we have new ideas that are not included here, uh, I think that we need to get staff to cost those out sooner as opposed to later. And then my question is, how will we make sure that any new ideas then get circulated back to the public? Because what we don't want to have happen is anybody say, oh, there you are, the 11th hour coming up with you know, new things. So that's one fear I have. We can't change the budget tool, but at the end of the day, we've been very clear that this is up to the board and, and superintendent. We, we might have an idea uh, that is not reflected in the budget tool. Um, I don't know yet. Let's see if you come up with those. Um, so I don't, I don't think necessarily we can go back out and all of a sudden survey people again. I think we've been very clear that um, this will be one way for people to weigh in. Um, I don't think we could add any, any I don't, we can't do it all over again. I think it would create such additional confusion um, to, to have everyone do it again at this point. Thank you for that clarification. Can I make a comment to that? If you supply it to us, we're not treating the tool as a voting device. We're treating it as a weighing machine to steal from earlier comments. So if you, if you know, it may not go back out to the public, but if we take it to the task force, I'll take any idea, right? We're, we're not wedded to just the tool. We're using the tool as an exploratory tool to gather input, but it is not a voting device. So if you share something with us, we'll take it. And, and it does reflect every idea that we received to the point we finally had to turn it on. Um, and some of the ideas you'll know on there, we, we've had discussion about it. I've had board members say, oh my God, Karen, how can that be on the, the choice? We didn't filter choices. We didn't say, well, we like these ideas, so let's put them on the budget tool. We, you know, we, and we do like these ideas, so they're reflected. Every idea that could be quantified uh, was act, is shown in, in the tool, those that we knew at that particular time. Ms. McLaughlin. So I do have a follow-up question. Um, it was my understanding that... Um, going on the comment that was just made, if there's other things that weren't listed there that might be considerations, um, that there were members on the task force that were talking about um, the furlough option, because you're talking about one year, not multi-year. So if it were if the federal government, I think, and other state governments have done it, or you have like um, four furlough days. One year versus, I the, this was one year. Um, the, the problem we have is we need to make cuts that actually substantially reduce the budget. We're not creating cuts that we're moving forward to fiscal year uh, 18. We, we can't, we can't, 
Well, technically, we know that the county forecast um, and revenue, you know, does change year to year. And if the county is saying, look, we didn't get the revenue, the, the county and the economy have not recovered as, as much as we had hoped. So if, if it's just, I, I'm not advocating for it, so let's just be clear <laughs> for anybody listening. What I asked the question, and I'm not, and that's what I would like answered is, it's my understanding that the, the task force, there were people on the task force who said, we would like that as one of the options to consider. It's not there. So how do I answer to people who ask me about that? Why, if you're telling us as board members bring forward things we don't see on there, and I've got task force members saying, well, we asked and that isn't there. So they served on the committee and their idea wasn't included. So we've removed, we didn't put furloughs on the, on the tool. We are talking about whether or not we'll recommend furloughs. Um, we're, the discussions, and, and Dr. Garza has been at each of the, each of the meetings, um, there may well be things that aren't on the tool that do get suggested. There were things that, you know, we, we did a lockdown for when we were gonna release the tool. Um, unfortunately, that was also the day that we had a meeting and we discussed several other items, and so there are probably 34, I think it is, mm -hmm. items, many of which are very small. Some of them are much larger, and furloughs is one of those that was discussed at that meeting where we also had already locked down the, or released the tool. So I wouldn't say that it's um, a highest priority by any means, but I wouldn't, but what we have costed, don't, and again, this is our suggestions to you, the same thing, the equivalent cost numbers as furloughs is there because we have one day, two day, three day, and four day cuts. So from a cost perspective for FY17, anyone that selects any of those costs has the same impact as whether we do it as a furlough. That's Your contracting correct. perspective may be you're gonna do it as a one-time uh, cut versus a we're gonna do this forever. From our suggestions from dollars, and the reason that we thought that we were asking it fair enough is that I don't think most of the people filling out the tool were thinking in a five-year time frame. They were thinking that year. So we have numbers that people could select that would have the same impact as a furlough up through four days. I um, also want to add, uh, there, you know, there, uh, as I mentioned before and as I think you alluded to, Matt, you know, we have varied perspectives on the task force. I think that's great. That's what we need to have varied viewpoints. Uh, another um, source of frustration, if you ask one or two, um, task force members is they want us to cut ERFC and as we've told them time and time again we can't just unilaterally cut that you have to really study the impact on the fund for an example you can't just say uh, we're no longer going to offer that for all of our new employees because the new employees if you don't have them in that system will actuarially affect the long-term liability of the fund, so we need to study it to see if, in fact, we could reduce. I've also told uh, the task force if, in fact, we find our place, ourselves in a place where we could do something different with the ERFC fund, it's at least my view at this point, given what I've heard from board members here or there, it may not be with the interest of using those savings to, uh, to balance the budget, but to shift potentially those savings into compensation. So those, those are just some other What's shown on the budget tool, we've primarily we've said, needs to be a long-term reduction, and we need to be able to uh, quantify it and know we can do it for this fiscal year 17. When Matt referred to the appendix that they're gonna develop, I think they're gonna reflect some of these ideas they'd like for us to look at in the long term, like potentially ERFC. Well, I'm just making clear for the record, I was not <laughs> suggesting furloughs. I have family members who have been experiencing that in recent years. I was only asking the question of what the committee was interested in. Okay, before Mrs. Strauss, I'm gonna recognize the chair. Okay, thank you. Um, just, uh, uh, Ms. Evans and I are also meeting managers today, so just looking at the clock, I mean, this is such an important conversation, but I feel like we could be here till midnight because we all have great questions and you have great answers. So um, just looking at our schedule, we were supposed to start governance at 1230 and it's now 120. Um, we have a closed meeting after that. I think what I'd like to propose, if you look at your agenda, um, is that we try to quickly wrap this up, have a quick governance conversation, go into closed meeting, flip items four and five on our agenda so that we have our um, park authority folks who are showing up here at two 
to talk to us so they don't have to wait. So we come out of close for at 2 o'clock for that. Um, and then we'll put superintendent priorities after that, if that's okay with everybody. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Strauss. Just very quickly, one other question that I am hearing in the community that um, what we put out um, doesn't answer it, but I feel it would be useful. People will say, well, um, at the, in the worst part of the recession, you all survived that somewhat intact. So, you know, people will say, well, this is the new normal, just get over it. And the issue of the impact of the federal stimulus, which had a tremendous positive impact on schools, the VRS issue, which also had a, a positive impact on our ability to get through it, but that all of those opportunities are gone. Um, it would be good to acknowledge that because a lot of people say, I don't understand, so why are you still belly aching and complaining? Because we talk about you have um, within the document, you show the cuts that have taken every year, and we look at the things that we can no longer control. And um, um, I think maybe defining, because people say, well, it's the new normal. I mean, that's sort of the new buzzword. And it's as though, get over it, we're all going to just have to adjust to the new normal. And adding that to, for a, if you believe in public schools and the education of children, um, the new normal doesn't hold. There is a, a problem or the fact that we still have to educate children unless we're going to accept that we're no longer going to educate children as a new normal. But I do find the balance in the discussion of that, we're talking about big picture ideas that may be, I don't know, in the budget document, but that is one piece that is not yet, because um, I'm finding I have to talk about that quite a bit. So thanks. So I'm going to make two brief comments and then we're done. So first of all, um, I know once in a while uh, members of our funding body um, yearn for line item control of the budget and uh, this tool offers them a legal way to exercise that uh, authority. And the second thing is that I think this is going to be a huge help in May because something that comes up in May is there's consideration of, well, you know, can we cut this, can we cut that and there's a lot of uncertainty and then sending these people scrambling around trying to cost things. Well, we've got all this stuff costed out. So this tool, I presume, will be available to us in May, and uh, I think we'll make our decision-making uh, much more refined in May. With that, we're, we're done. Oh, Mr. Moody. Do we still need to take a 30-second break for taping? Switch? Yes. 30. Okay, 30 seconds. Don't move. 